Hallelujah. Come on, put those blessed hands together wherever you are. We're so excited that you chose to worship with the Rosehill family this morning. Come on, lift those hands. Lift those hands wherever you are. Can we pray? Father, we come this morning just saying thank you, Father. We thank you for keeping us, Lord. We thank you for waking us up this morning, Lord, allowing us to experience a day that we've never seen before, Father. Father, we even thank you now as we're in this season, Father, of Corona, Father, we know and understand that you are the bomb in Gileam. So, Father, we give it all to you, and we know that you are our healer, you are our deliverer, you are our provider. So, Father, we lift our hands to you this morning as a sign of surrenders, as a sign of respect, Father, saying, have your way in our very lives, Father. Now, Lord, we ask that you would shower this place today with your anointing from on high like never before. Bless each and every household that's watching, Father, in Louisiana and all over this country, even all over this world, Lord. We thank you now for our senior pastor and teacher as he prepares to come and share your uncompromising word, Father. Have your way in this place today, Father, and we thank you in advance for the rhema word that shall come our way, Father. Father. And Father, when you send your word, don't let us just be hearers, but let us be doers. Let us catch your word, grasp it, and run with it, and apply it to our everyday lives. And watch your word manifest itself strong and mighty. Lord, we love you. We honor you in this place today. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, wherever you are, begin to clap those hands. Begin to tell the Lord thank you. Come on, somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now receive now our anointed music ministry as they lead us higher in praise and worship.
Say thanks for the things you've done for me. Things I did not deserve, yet you gave to prove your love for me. The voices of a million angels cannot express my gratitude, all that I am and ever hold.
Hey, good morning, Rose Hill. God bless you. I'm so excited to be in the house of the Lord. I know you are too. I know some of you are saying, Pastor, we're not at church. Well, you don't have to be at church. Your house is the house of the Lord because the presence of the Lord is there. And so I just want to take a moment to say thank you to all of you who have been given religiously. We appreciate your faithfulness so much and your commitment to the ministry and your commitment to the vision. And so we're going to take a moment and raise our offering at this point. And if you've been given already and you know how to give, you can just keep giving the same way that you've been given. But listen, we wanted to make it easy for you. So we developed what's called a short code. And if you are okay with text messaging, you can actually text 84321 and put that into the two line and then go to the messaging box and just simply put the dollar sign and the amount that you want to give. Press the send button. If you're new, it'll send you a message and you can fill out that information and send it back to us. If you've done it before, then it'll just register your giving. So listen, take a moment if you would, sit back, relax, give as the Lord has prospered you to give. And right after this next song, I'll be right back with a word. I can't wait to preach to you. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its word, it sounds like music here, my it's the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh uh-huh. 
Hey, good morning, family. I'm back. Listen, I'm excited about the word this morning. I'm ready to get into the word. How many of you are ready to get into the word? Well, good. If you're ready, grab your Bibles and turn with me to the gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter number 13 is where you'll find our assignment for today. Listen, I hope the word blesses you. One of the things that we want to do is, is to give you a word of encouragement, but not keep you long at the same time. We know that there are so many other places that you could be. We're so grateful that you took time to join us on our stream today. Listen, look at Matthew 13 with me and look, if you would, at verse number three. The Bible says, and he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, behold, the sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the road and the birds came and ate them up. Others fell in the rocky places where they did not have much soil and immediately they sprang up because they had no depth of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched because they had no root and they withered away. Others fell among the thorns and the thorns came up and choked them out and others fell on good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some 60 and some 30. He who has ears to hear, let them hear. It was Charles Dickens that said, and I quote, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was an age of wisdom, and it was an age of foolishness. It was an epoch of belief, and it was an epoch of unbelief. It was a season of light, it was a season of darkness. It was a spring of hope. It was a winter of despair. Now, when you hear those words, most of you would probably say that that's nothing but an ocean of oxymorons, a sea of contrast. And in most cases, you would be correct. But the truth is, that particular passage not only has depth and profundity, but truth. Because most of us don't realize it, but the best of times are oftentimes birthed out of the worst of times. And an age of wisdom is often birthed out of an age of foolishness. An age of belief is often birthed out of an age of doubt. And a spring of hope often comes from a winter of despair. I want you to think about that as you think about what we're presently experiencing. And I want to warn you, I'm not going to spend the rest of my time talking about corona. But I just want you to think about something. There's probably nobody on earth who's living at this present time who's going through or has gone through what we're presently going through. Yeah, that means it's unprecedented. And everybody is saying, you know what? I want to get through this, and so do I. I want to return back to normal, and so do I. But here's a heavy question for you. What have you learned from it? Because I don't just want to get through it. I want to glean from it. I want to grow from it. I want to learn from it. The Bible says that we should count it out joy when we find ourselves in situations like this because situations like this do something for us that not being in that situation can't do. And so here's the heavy question. What have I learned from this? I know one thing. I won't take the simple things in life for granted, and I hope you won't either. Simple things like a family gathering. Simple things like worshiping together in church. Yeah, simple things like going to the park or to a ball game and things like that. And so it ought to push all of us into a place where we love more. We're more united. We're a kinder people, a caring people. And watch this. It should push all of us closer to God. The truth is it should cause a realignment in our lives. Yeah, I want you to think about this for a moment. We drive these cars, but every so often these cars go out of alignment and they need to be realigned. Yeah. And so how do you know when your car needs to be realigned? It starts pulling to one side or the other side. So if you're driving down the street and you take your hands off the wheel and it starts to pull, it's an indication that it's out of line. And for many of us, God is speaking to us through this. And I believe that God is telling us that your life is out of alignment. Yeah, so how do we take that? We say, God, put me back in alignment. Well, how do I get back in alignment? 
First of all, I know it's been a while since some of you have taken geometry, but in geometry you have a y-axis and you have an x-axis. The y-axis is the vertical axis. In other words, in order to get my life in alignment, the first thing that I have to do is cultivate my relationship with God. Yeah. Yeah. Things like this ought to push us closer to God. And I'll show you in a minute that some people are allowing it to push them further from God when the truth is it should be bringing all of us closer to God. Yeah, that y-axis. The Bible says if we draw nigh to him, he'll draw nigh to us. The Bible says he's a present help in time of trouble. And so what I'm trying to get you to understand is I believe that God is telling not only the country but the world, put me back in my rightful place. Put me back at the forefront. Let me drive. Let me be the main motivating factor and force in your life. And I can put you back in proper alignment. And then watch this, there's an x-axis. X-axis represents those lateral relationships. Once I've got my vertical relationship in alignment, I've got to have my lateral relationships in alignment, which means that I've got to treat people well. Yeah, being in the house has made us understand what's really important. Listen, there's nothing wrong with having financial wealth. I'm not knocking it at all. It's a wonderful thing to be blessed financially. But being in the house has let all of us know that what really matters is our relationship with God and those who are closest to us. Our wives or your husbands, your children, those people who have your last name. And many of us really had gone off straight or gotten off path. What do you mean? We had started taking them for granted. We had started taking God for granted. And the truth is, this thing that we're going through should push us back into proper alignment so that we can live a balanced life that's pleasing to God. Now, I want you to think about this. Here in the text, the Bible talks about a sower. Jesus talks about a sower, a man who sows seed. He's using an agriculture, uh, an, uh, an agricultural analogy. That's important because many people at that time were into agriculture and they could understand this. And he spoke to them in parables. And the Bible says that he sat in a boat and he began to teach. This is good. And he talked to them about sowing a seed or sowing the word, but he used gardening terms. That's important. I want you to get this. Many of us, when we're planting a garden, we never really think about what's really important. We just simply give it the eye test. What do you mean? That looks like a good place to plant a garden. I'm going to plant my garden right there. Well, how do you know that's a good place to plant your garden? Well, many of us just simply look with our eyes and make decisions based on what we see. But in 2016, we had a monumental flood. My house flooded. My wife and I, my kids, we all flooded. Our neighborhood flooded. And as a result, a lot of contaminants came into our neighborhood, oils and all types of things. And man, when it was over, our grass was horrible. It was brown and it was beat up and it was having a tough time recovering. So what I did was I called a specialist in and I said, listen, I want you to help me get my grass back on track. And before he did anything, before he planted any new grass, before he did anything, what he did was he took a pH test. He took a sample of the soil and did a pH test. pH stands for power of hydrogen. He, he did a pH test to see how, how the soil was because he realized it doesn't matter what you plant if the soil is bad. Oh, this is so good. I want you to get this. And so before he started planting anything, he started fixing my soil so that what he planted would grow. And many people have not even considered that. And I'm going to show you something. And Jesus is teaching everybody, including the disciples, that the word of God is awesome, but you must also consider the environment that you're planting in. Oh, come here, somebody. Have you taken a pH test on the atmosphere of your heart? Yeah, how, how is your heart? If the word is planted in your heart, will it grow or will the pollution or the toxins in your heart contaminate the seed that was planted? 
Come here, somebody. Jesus says, there was a sower. The thing that was consistent in the text was the seed. The seed was good. The seed was the word. The seed was infallible. But as infallible as the seed was, Jesus says the environment does make a difference. And so he says the man planted on four different types of soils. First of all, he says he sowed by the roadside or the wayside. He sowed on hard pan, a place where people had been walking, a place that was tough, that was hardened. So when he threw the seeds there, the seeds couldn't penetrate the soil. And he says the birds will swoop down and get them. And likewise, he says, Satan will go down and get the seed that was planted because the heart was compacted. Here's a heavy question. Has your heart been walked on so much that it's become hard and compacted? Yeah, I want you to think about this. When we think about a hard heart, hard heart can be the product of many things. It can be the product of sin. And so if sin hasn't been dealt with in your life, if Jesus Christ is not the Lord and Savior of your life and sin has not been dealt with, then sin creates a hard pain in your life. And watch this, for everybody who's been beaten down, you may be saved. And many, many people may be saying, well, I'm saved, but the word is not producing in my life. So why is the word not producing in my life? Here's a question. How's your heart? Heart being your mind. Your mind. How is your mind? Have you been beaten down so much that when the word is planted that you've had so much outside influence that the word cannot have the effect that it should? Here's the thing that I learned about pH. It wasn't just about what was in the soil that created the pH. It was about what was introduced to the soil that created the pH. In other words, at one time the soil could have been good, but bad rain, toxicity, pollutants, all those things could have come in and ruined what used to be good. That's why you got to guard your heart because your heart can be good. But if you don't guard your heart and you let anything in, any type of music, any type of movie, any type of speaking, any type of company, then that which once was good and productive and fruitful could be transformed into something that becomes toxic. Yeah, there's so many of us right now that, that, that our hearts have become toxic because people have walked on them. People have mistreated us. People have, have hurt us on the job. People have hurt us in relationships. And there are all types of pressures that have pressed down on us, causing hard hearts. And the devil loves that because the devil says that a hard heart makes it easy for me to steal. Yeah, all that good word you got. And all I do is take it, the enemy says. Because your heart is so hard, it's impenetrable. Then he said, is this good? Then he said that there was a second type of soil. He says the second type of soil is stony soil. Watch this. It's got some good in it, but it's got some hard places that make it hard for the seed to take root. And as a result, he says, when the seed is planted there, the seed pops up quickly, but has no depth, has no root system. Therefore, when the sun comes out, it's scorched and it dies because it had no roots. And then Jesus begins to explain it to the disciples in the text. And he says to them, this, this, this is what I mean by that. He says, a person who receives the word on a stony heart is a person who receives the word with joy and they shout and they're excited and they run and they say, man, things are going to change in my life. And when they're in the sanctuary or when they're in the home streaming, they say, man, I got it. That's it. But the Bible says they have no depth because there were stones in the soil. In other words, your, your soil wasn't as hard as the first one, but you still got hard spots. And he says because of that, there's no depth. And what happens is, he says, when persecution comes because of the word's sake, 
Because when you get the word in your life and you stand on the word, there will be persecution. When you stand on the written word, there will be persecution. People will talk about you at work. People will talk about you in your job. Your family will talk about you. People who used to love you and like you and go out with you. When you stop going out and doing the things you used to do and saying the stuff that you used to say, they'll talk about you. And if you're not strong and you don't have any depth to your roots, then you'll turn back and join with them again so that they'll stop talking about you. But if the word ever takes root and I'm gonna preach my mic off if the word ever takes root watch this and so persecution is coming when you when you stand on the word but not only the written word but the spoken word when God speaks something into your hearing that's just for you that's unique for you and what God has called you to do there will always be people who oppose what God told you. When you tell them what God told you, they'll always oppose what God told you. Oh, you can't do that. No, you're not, you're not smart enough for that. Who, you? You're going to start a business? You, you're going to start a ministry? Yo, I remember when I, when I started pastoring and the Lord told me to pastor this church, I know the Lord spoke to me, but there were some people who said, I, I just don't see it. Nah, he won't make it. He won't make it. And and that's cool in the gang. I'm fine with it because here's what I know. There always will be opposition. And some of you, you're waiting to people uh, to people stop opposing you before you do what God said. No, you're going to have to do what God said. God called Peter out of the boat when it was storming, not when it was calm. And too many people are waiting for calm situations to obey the word. You're going to always have opposition, persecution. It's all coming. They're going to talk about you at work. Here's what I learned. When I was in corporate America, they talked about me until they needed me. Yeah, when something happened at work, something happened to their kids, something happened to their spouse, then all of a sudden the same ones who called me a holy roller, the same ones who said, you always got that Bible in your desk, the same ones who said, it don't take all of that, say, can you get a prayer through for me? So you can't be moved by the movement. You got to be moved by what you believe and what God spoke into your heart. And then finally, watch this, I got to let you go. My clock is ticking. But the Bible says, Bible says there was another type of soil. It was hard, compacted soil. There was stony soil. But then there was soil with thorns. I want you to see this. There was, there was soil with thorns. It's right there in the text. Others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. And Jesus begins to explain that to the disciples and he says something powerful he says he says the thorns represent the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth and it choked out the word and it became unfruitful watch this in other words they let the cares of this world they got so worried so fearful so doubtful that the word that was in them, that was a good word, got choked out. You can't let crazy corona choke the word out of your life. Come on, somebody. You can't let a red bill choke the word out of your life. You can't let a circumstance or a situation or a person talking about you or whatever the care is in the world. If I had time to preach, I'll tell you that he's a, he's a heavy load carrier. He can help you carry any load that you have. But then it says the deceitfulness of riches or wealth. And many people just look at the word wealth, but it says the deceitfulness of wealth. In other words, when you get so driven by wealth that you'll do anything to get it, it'll choke the word out of your life because God can't function in an environment of greed, an environment of deceitfulness. An environment of lies, trickery. Yeah, God says you don't have to do any of that stuff. Do it my way. Do it the straight up way. Do it the honest way. Do it the way that you're supposed to do it and I'll bless it. But don't get so caught up in the cares of the world that you let the cares of the world change your character and choke the word that's in you. No, the word of God is supposed to be fruitful. It's supposed to be life changing, life altering, life transforming. The heavy question that we have to ask is, if the word is not transforming our lives, then how is the soil that it's being planted in? 
I heard something one time that was real heavy. Somebody said the most expensive and expansive real estate that you'll ever own is five inches wide. It's the distance between this ear and this ear. If you can get this real estate right, you can own any real estate. But the greatest challenge is the mind. It's getting my mind right, getting my focus right when I'm going through things. Because anybody can keep their focus when things are fine. Anybody can be a friend when things are fine. Anybody can be in faith when things are fine. The truth of the matter is when things are fine, that's not even faith. We need faith right now. We need faith that every morning we get our phone and the number of virus contaminations has gone up. We need, our, we need faith now. We keep seeing death tolls rise. We need faith now. Listen, and then the Bible says that, that there's a type of soil that had no stones, no thorns, and it hadn't been packed down. And it produced 160 or 30 fold. That's the place that we want to live. We need people whose mind has been cleansed so when the word is planted, it can be fruitful. We need prayer warriors right now. We need faith walkers right now. We need people because the other day, the Lord changed my prayer. Yeah, I've been praying, God, 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 destroy corona. God, remove it from the earth. God, send it back to the pits of hell. I've been praying. I've been praying. And then the other day, God says, just start thanking me. Start thanking me that it's done. You, you prayed enough for it to leave. Now, thank me that it's done. Don't be moved by the numbers. Don't be moved by what you see. Can you thank me when the toes are going up? Can you believe that it's already done? Even though the information contradicts the revelation. Yeah. I'm not worried about the statistics, worried about what God says. I, I wish I could get every believer just to lift their hands and say, Lord, I thank you that it's done. And I, I've been praying so much, God, that I'm changing my prayer now from, from move it, God, to thank you, God, because at some point I got to have enough faith that you're able to do exceeding abundantly above and have done. Oh, God, I wish I had some worshipers who lift their hands right there and just give the Lord a thank you. And watch this, I'm about to close. I got to go, but I'm feeling this. I, I want you to get this. Uh, I, I grew up, my, brother, my brother's here with me. He's, he's helping out, and uh, my sisters, they're, they're going to be watching on the stream. My dad's going to be watching on the stream. We, we all grew up gardening. I'm closing. We all grew up gardening. Yeah, my dad would go to the back, and my dad could make rows, garden rows, straighter, than anybody I've ever seen in my life. He, all he needed was a shovel. Take that shovel and turn that earth over on one side, take it on the other side, turn it over, pile it up in a nice, almost triangular form, and he'd, he'd dig a whole row. And then all of a sudden he'd tell us, now go get that rake, and we go get an iron rake, an iron rake, and chop up, chop it up, chop up that dirt, and chop it up, and chop it up until it got small and pliable and workable. And then we would form up, form up a row and make it flat on the top and then put a little hole so that we could plant a seed because we understood that the environment that we planted the seed in makes a difference. Watch this. Why don't you let what you're going through serve as your gardening tools that make, to make your heart pliable? Why don't you let corona and bills and relationships and all of this stuff, instead of pushing you away from God, let it push you to God? Watch this. The Bible says God speaks in a still, small voice. Why does God whisper? I believe God whispers because God always wants to be close. Somebody missed that. The only way you can hear a whisper is if you're close. And many of us miss the voice of God because we've gotten too far away from him. But if we will let our trials and our tribulations and our situations serve as the shovels that dig up the hard parts of our heart and flip them over, if we will let, let our trials and tribulations serve as that rake that will chop up that stuff and make it pliable so that when the word of God is planted in our lives, it can be the transformative agent that God created it to be. We can make sure our pH is balanced so that when it's planted, it brings forth the harvest 30, 60, or even 100 fold. As I close today, let me ask you a simple question. How is your heart? Oftentimes when we say that, we, we go here. But no, how is your heart? How is your thinking? How is your focus? 
how is the environment that you're planting the word in? Is it conducive for the word to grow and produce in your life? If not, you better take a test and begin to do everything that you can to alter the environment so that the word of God can be planted. And when it's planted, it can produce the power that it's designed to produce. God bless you. We love you. Listen, come back again next Thursday for some more powerful praise and worship. Come back next Thursday for some more powerful preaching. Listen, I can't wait to preach to you. This is what I was born to do. I love this. Listen, God bless you. Have a great day. Listen, don't forget to comment on our page. Comment. Let us know that you are here. Also, comment. Tell us where you're from. We go through all of that stuff. We love seeing your comments. We love seeing your amens. We love seeing all of it. So make sure you leave a comment before you leave. And God bless you. Listen, go back. Watch the broadcast again. Yeah, we'll put it back on after our 12 o'clock service. Go to YouTube and watch it on YouTube. And go to Rose Hill Church. There's a black and white logo, Rose Hill Church. Rose, one word. Hill, one word. Church, one word. Black and white logo. Subscribe and press the little bell so you can get notifications whenever we post a video. And, man, we can't wait to service you. We can't wait for you to watch the service and watch it over and over again. God bless you. We love you. Have a fantastic day. Mm -hmm.